Well, hello, this is Adam, and welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. Today, we're going to talk about the strange features, quirks, idiosyncrasies. Some people don't like the word quirks. I guess somebody else on YouTube uses it. So we'll say idiosyncrasies, cool features, etc., of these 1974 marquee. I guess marquee is the plural of marquee. Uh, one is this 74 marquee coupe, the base model. I bought this in Park Ridge, Illinois about a, uh, three, four weeks ago now. And it's got 17,000 miles. It's a black car. It's one of 82 painted in black, one of 12 that are black on black. So super, super rare car. Only about, again, 2,800 of these base coupes made in 1974. And then this is my 1974 marquee Brome hardtop, the last year of the hardtop for Ford cars. They did call after 74 the cars with the pillar, the pillarless hardtop, which is kind of, you know, some marketing song and dance because there was frameless door glass as opposed to the earlier post sedans that had a frame at the top of the window. But this is a true hardtop, no B pillar here. This is also a hardtop coupe. These windows, when they go down, there's no pillar as well. So we're going to talk about some of the features of both of these and where else would you get to compare a base marquee to a marquee brome and see some of the differences and talk about what's cool, what's not, what's weird, etc. So let's take a look. Okay, so let's do a walk around of these two marquee. First is a 74 base car and then you have the 74 brome four-door hardtop over here. Now the first interesting feature is obviously the hidden headlights, which was not an uncommon feature on Fords of the era, mostly Mercury's and Lincoln's, although in the late 60s the LTDs had the hidden headlights and the Mercury's did not. These are operated by two vacuum actuators. There's one on either side. In earlier years there was a single one that was in the middle and it would raise them both in tandem. By this year, for whatever reason, they went to two individual ones and they made them out of less expensive metal so they tend to corrode from the inside out. You can imagine this system gets some moisture in it and then it causes some troubles but these thankfully still work. You can also see, next feature, cornering lights. This 74 marquee has the cornering light option down there. You get a separate cornering light. This one does not. It just has the regular side marker light. They both have the body side molding, the appearance protection group, which I've taken the door edge guards off, and the bumper guards with the rub strip in the middle. Next, here's a little fun one. Just to make sure everybody knew that you got a marquee brome, you got not only the griffins here, but you got the brome lettering on the vinyl roof. Here, uh-oh, no brome on the standard ones. Also some big interior trim differences. You can see here's the base cloth interior. There's no armrest in the middle. You can also see the base door panels. This is an Armstrong windows car with crank windows. And it's a handsome door panel, but no cloth on it. It's just all vinyl in spite of this being cloth. And you get the overhead dome light but no sail panel lights on this car back there, nothing. You also, if you open the door here, take a look at the carpet, you get like a loop pile carpeting in the base marquee. And again, a shot of the door panel. If we transition to the marquee brome, you notice that you get this really funky designed cloth, which to me mirrors the 1970 Buick Electra cloth print. Very similar to it. Doesn't have a nice hand, it's kind of got a rough hand, but the seats are very comfortable. This does have the twin comfort lounge seat option, dual armrests, split bench. And then on the inside, notice the door panel. You get much richer door panel, in terms of having cloth up here. On these marquee brooms, they did come standard with power windows, but you could get a power window delete option, in which case they gave you the base marquee door panel, strangely. And check out the carpet here, super deep pile 
carpeting on these marquee bromes. This came in in 1973. The 1972s and ones didn't have this deep pile carpeting like this. You also get the lights in the sail panel in addition to the dome light. This one does have the reading lights as part of the dome light as well. You can see there are switches on either side there and you get little individual reading lights to accompany the overhead dome or if you want to be reading while the car is driving. Notice also that on the instrument panel it says brome here on the brome trim but on this one it just says marquee Other cool features of the marquee brome, if you look back here and look along the length of the car, you'll notice that there is this fender peak molding that runs the complete length of the car all the way at the top here, all the way down, and terminates right there above the turn signal. And on the base car, there is not one. It's missing. I actually like the look, to be honest, without that fender peak molding better. I think it's cleaner. I wish this car didn't have the body side molding, but they all pretty much did. Very typical option. I don't think I've seen one without it. And you can see the difference there between the fender peak molding and the car without the fender peak molding. Also, in terms of interesting things, this dash pad is, was changed for 74. 73 is a one-year only dash pad that has like this radius that comes out right above the radio. They went to this dash pad in 74 and kept it through 1978 on all of the marquee. This one also has the same dash pad my Colony Park does too. I'm trying to collect all the vehicles in Mercury's lineup for 74. So far, I've got the base coupe the four-door hardtop, a four-door pillared hardtop, and a colony park. Another interesting feature is in 1974 there were three different interiors that you could get. You had, as I mentioned, this base, you had the marquee brome, and then they had the grand marquee. This was the first year the grand marquee, that wasn't the title of the model, but the grand marquee was a extra cost interior option that you could get. And it had kind of ribbed seating. I actually think the brome trim looks better, looks richer than the Grand Marquis. But obviously the Grand Marquis became the name that stuck and that really happened after Ford launched the Fox bodied regular Marquis in the early 80s, 1983 I believe. And then the Grand Marquis went on the Panther platform car. That's where that nameplate went. The Fox bodied marquee was sunset after just a few years. The Panther platform one stuck around for many, many more years and became the grandma and fleet taxi car that we all loved and knew. Next on these in terms of strange features is this trunk lock cover, which by itself isn't strange, but it was on the 1971 cars, it was gone for 1972 and 3, and then it came back in 74. So it had this on again, off again placement on the cars. I think it looks really classy, especially when the red is nice and rich. These tend to fade over time. This one is a bit faded, not bad, but I'd love a NOS one if anybody's got one of these trunk lock covers. Feel free to email me. They're getting hard to find these days. I think another interesting feature about these is they really tried to emulate Lincoln. Remember, Ford used to advertise these as the ride engineered by Lincoln Mercury. They had the jeweler in the back cutting a diamond, which SNL famously parodied with a rabbi doing a bris in the back of the cars. And they do have such a quality about them, but you know, the Lincoln reference extended even to these taillights, the three taillights, very similar to the 74 Continental. And the overall styling theme was very similar. Certainly that fender peak molding echoes the 1961 
Continental as an example. And even in the front, this black lettering on the grill and the very vertically oriented grill just screams Lincoln overall. Next, in terms of funky features, we have the Ford tilt steering wheel, which is a really strange operation on these. And to operate the tilt steering wheel, like GM, you'd have a separate lever here. You push this turn signal backward, and that's what moves the steering wheel up and down. It feels like you're going to break the turn signal every time you operate it, and some of them indeed did break off. I tried to just keep it in one position and leave it and not operate it. I mean, I'm the only person who drives these vehicles, so why do I need to uh, keep moving the tilt wheel up and down? Next on this particular Marquis Brome, you have the automatic climate control. These did have automatic climate control, and this is not just an outlet temperature here. This automatically changes the fan speed, the mode door, the temperature, the outlet temperature, the fan. It says low and high, and you basically, I think you have four fan speeds that they're a little bit slower in low, they're a little bit higher in high, and then you have max where it's just full blower all the time when you have it in that setting. And this is different than the regular marquee. You can see here on my other car, if you just had the base car with air conditioning, you get the slider bars, and it says in fancy script, I open the door here. Air conditioning in some really nice cursive font. So this is just truly a manual car from a heat and AC perspective. That's what the controls look like. Next you have this headliner, which is common to all the marquee in 74. They went back to this headliner from in 73. It was a perforated vinyl. Not quite sure why. That 73 was the one year only where they did that. 72 is kind of this velour-esque headliner. So they kept changing headliners for whatever reason. I guess to change up the interior of the car. I don't know that anybody really noticed though. This looks handsome. Not bad. Next is this little vent down here. This, if you had a car without air conditioning, was you'd have a pull and then you could open that to get fresh air ventilation just like other kick well vents on other cars without air conditioning. What is it doing on an air conditioning car then? And by the way you notice there's not one on the driver's side. That on the air conditioning cars becomes the recirc door which I thought was pretty ingenious. So when you have this on AC and all the way to the cold setting you can actually hear the vacuum and it's opening that door down there. So let's see if you can see it. I'll close it. See it close now? So that is the research door for the AC. Again, it opens if you put this all the way on cold. GM did this a little differently. If you put this temperature selector all the way on cold, it not only opened the research door, which was not like that, but it would also kick the fan all the way on high, which I didn't like, but that's how GM did it. Here it doesn't kick the fan on high, but it does open the research door. It also closes off the heater control valve under hood so that coolant doesn't flow through the heater core when it's on max AC. Okay, next let's take a look under hood and you'll see here both cars have a feature that's unique to 1974. That is this starter interlock relay. And the purpose of that was to be a button that you could push in the event the system failed. But for the part way through the 1974 model year, all cars, as mandated by the federal government, had to have a system where you could not start them unless the seat belts were buckled. So the driver's seat, you have to have buckled in order for the car to start. And then in the passenger seat, 
you have to have it buckled and then so if you put a bag of groceries here as an example you have to buckle your groceries in and people just hated this because if they're pulling the car in and out of the garage you had to buckle the seat belt and it went away partway through 1974 but both of these cars have that and they've been since disabled because it's an annoying system and I can't can't blame whomever disabled it like I said imagine having to buckle your seatbelt every time you park your car. Consequently, on a lot of these Fords, particularly the ones with the standard belts like these have, which are the black non-color keyed belts, you'll notice these belts are pretty worn even on cars with low miles because somebody's been buckling their seatbelt and unbuckling it, just getting in and out of the garage. It took a lot of wear. You'll also see the difference here. This is the starter relay, but you've got a power window circuit breaker here. And on this car, which is heavily undercoated, there is no circuit breaker there. You also get, I love this, take a look at that, you get a very small vacuum canister on this car as a reservoir tank for the climate control. And on this car you get a bigger high C juice can. Lovely. Even different size vacuum reservoirs, I think that's pretty funky. And finally, under hood, one other strange feature, this alternator belt down here, you notice it's a pretty short belt. I believe the only way that you can change the alternator belt is to actually take the fan off. This belt is too small of a belt to get around that fan, which is crazy, but it's the only way I've been able to get it off. If somebody else knows a better way, let me know. I just can't see how you do it. You gotta take obviously the front two belts off. But again, this belt is so small that it doesn't fit around that big fan and you've gotta take the fan out. I always thought that was different, shall we say. Other than that, these cars still have the York two-piston AC compressor, which works pretty well, but Ford would later go to the GM A6 compressor. It does have a GM Saginaw steering pump. So Ford was starting to use some GM components under hood, much to the chagrin of the Blue Oval lovers. This back here is the heater control valve that I was talking about. So if you don't have any heat in the winter, check to make sure that, that there's a little slider on that that moves as the research door opens and closes. Make sure that it's moving and not stuck. Often they're stuck and you move them back and forth a few times and they, they get free. Old parts acting old. Let's close the hoods and take one last look at the two 1974 Mercury's. Where else are you going to see 274 Mercury's different body styles in excellent condition other than rare classic cars. Thanks again for watching and until next time, take care.